Yeah, so this phrase mindfulness has become really popular nowadays and I think it often gets watered down. There's often, even in the meditation world, the deeper meditation world, there's two types of mindfulness, it seems. There's kind of the vipassana, you know, noting, like lifting, lifting, eating, eating, chewing, 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 kind of focused yeah. mindfulness. And then there's this twin mindfulness that you've been referring to, which is something that maybe you could unpack for us. Yeah. So that's a good question because uh, first we have to understand what mindfulness is and where it comes from. It comes from the word, uh, the Pali word, which is sati. And that comes from the Sanskrit word, which is smriti, which means to remember. And what are we remembering? We're remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. And that's really the twin mindfulness. The mindfulness that's understand are understood commonly is this, as you said, this mindfulness of eating or mindfulness of walking or mindfulness of uh, breathing as well or whatever it might be. And what's happening there is the mind becomes super concentrated, in, let's say, in the mindfulness of eating instead of actually observing how mind is moving and how mind's attention is working. It's just super focused on on the eating. And so you're just mindful of the eating rather than seeing how the mind is working. Mm. The twin mindfulness is looking at the mind's attention. Yes, you are aware that you are eating. Yes, you are aware of the taste of the food. Yes, you're aware of the texture of the food and the biting and all of that. Fine. But what you're, and this is the crucial part of it, what you're aware of is how is mind responding to it? Mm. Is the mind taking it personally? Is the mind craving? Or is the mind seeing it as an impersonal process? And so twin, the twin mindfulness, as you put it, is that remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one object to the other. In doing so, you're seeing in the movement of that mind, is there any craving? In the movement of that mind, is there peace or is there agitation? Is there craving or is there no craving? And by using that kind of mindfulness, you're able to immediately recognize if there's craving and use the rest of the six hour process to let that mm. go. So this, we really might equate it with the psychology term of co metacognition. Metacognition, a yeah. Lot of ways. Observing the mind itself, observing how mind's attention moves. That's like mind seeing mind, so to speak, that metacognition. Right. Yeah, and another difference I guess I'd emphasize is instead of having a laser beam of attention that's really zoomed in on some part of your experience, like one of the five aggregates, it sounds like there's no sense of being the one that's mindful. You're just observing the mind. Exactly. In some ways. And this is what then naturally goes into the experience of the open aware jhanas. Because if you have the mindfulness that's super focused, then all you're doing is you're suppressing the hindrances and you're suppressing the mind. Whereas if you have this metacognition, as you say, where mind is watching how its attention is moving, then it's aware enough to be able to recognize what different factors are arising in the jhana. Hence the Anupada Sutta, where Sariputta is able to see the different kinds of factors that are arising. But his mind is still mindful. His mindfulness is sharp and he still has collectedness around his object of meditation. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, I think a lot of the confusion arises from that because it does break up the different foundations of mindfulness and you can see how people would think, I need to pay attention to this particular aspect of my experience. So what's your interpretation of that Sutta or how does that relate to this understanding of mindfulness? Yeah, if you go back to the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, when we talk about the body, for example, there are certain actual meditation objects that are given. For example, seeing the 32 uh, impurities of the body, the Asuba meditation, uh, or looking at the, the body as being dead and different process of decay. And these are meditations uh, prescribed for the lust that might be in the body. But aside from that, then there is uh, different kinds of levels. So you have mindfulness of the body, you have mindfulness of uh, feeling, you have mindfulness of chitta, as they say, or as I say, is, is mind or mindset, which is observing how different kinds of moods and mindsets arise. And then you have what is known as the mindfulness of the dhamma or, or dhammas. Dhammas here meaning phenomena. So the five hindrances 
Anytime you recognize there's a five a, a hindrance, you're using mindfulness. Uh, the enlightenment factors. Anytime you're aware that there is present this enlightenment factor in the mind, you're using the mindfulness of phenomena, or the five aggregates, or the four noble truths. Anytime you recognize there is suffering present, you're aware of the second noble truth, uh, or rather the first noble truth. Anytime you're recognizing there's craving, you're aware of the second noble truth of craving. Anytime you see the mind is letting go of that craving and experiencing the cessation, you're aware of the third noble truth. So it's not, it's not a step-by-step -step process in the sense that you have to go through and see the mind looking at body, and then you have to look at mind looking at feeling. It's whatever arises in that moment, mind's attention will move, sometimes from the body, or sometimes through the awareness of a hindrance present, or sometimes to a feeling, whether it's physical or mental, or just a mindset or a mood. Mm. But the other way to look at it, and this is just a, a, a simple interpretation based on the experience of the jhanas, is to say you're getting to subtler and subtler levels of understanding when you're using the jhana process. So you first are more aware of the body when you're in the coarser jhanas, then you're aware of the feeling, which is when you have the experience of joy, and like pity and sukha. And then you're aware of the mindset where you're able to see the arising and passing away of consciousnesses. And then finally you're aware of phenomena, namely the arising of suffering and the cessation of suffering. So that's one way to experience it. But I'm just saying generally, there's no need to have, having, having any need to make it an exercise where you have to first look at the body then you have to look at the feeling, then you have to look at the mind, then you have to look at the phenomena. These are all broken down for you to have better understanding and better clarity, but they can arise in whatever way they will arise. Sometimes the attention will move to the body, as, as I said, or sometimes it will move to the attention to one of the noble truths, or it will just move to a feeling, or whatever it might be. The point there in the Satipatthana Sutta is to be mindful for the purpose of recognizing if there is craving present or not. Yeah, and hearing you talk about that, it strikes me that the other definition of mindfulness starts at a false premise that you are in control of your attention somehow. Yeah. Whereas this definition, remembering to observe how attention moves on its own, yes. starts with right view. Yes, exactly. It is already with that view that the attention is impersonal. So it sounds like you're describing two different types, or they're saying there's two different types of jhana. Could you explain the concentration jhana versus a twim jhana? Yeah. And we might talk, actually define what twim is too. Yeah. So when we talk about, well, we start off with that mindfulness, with the assumption that the attention, as we said, that assumption is that the, mind, uh, the attention itself is personal. So there is a personalizing in the sense of you're directing your attention. So instead of actually just observing how the attention is moving, you're actually directing it. And by doing so, you're becoming super focused or laser pointed towards one object or towards just, for example, you were talking about the mindfulness of eating. You're just like watching how you know, you're eating or how it tastes and things like that. When you do that, you're not really having any insight into what's arising. There is just this experience of mind's attention being directed a certain way, but there's no actual insight that arises from there. So you have no way of understanding how to deal with the pain that's arising when there's just a noting, here is pain. But what do you do with that and how are you looking at or observing what the reaction to that pain is? You might notice the reaction to the pain, but if you're not able to use a six hour process, then you're not actually dealing with the craving that's result or the aversion rather that's arising because of that pain. You're just noting there is aversion and that's it. When we talk about the twin jhanas, we are starting with that understanding that the attention itself is impersonal. So you're just seeing how attention moves dependent upon mental contact or physical contact or whatever it might be. So you, you're aware that there is an attention to loving kindness, for example. Now you're aware that there is the attention to loving kindness, but you're not so super focused that the mind becomes oblivious to any kind of hindrance that might arise. 
Because when you become super focused, you're not only suppressing the mind, but you're suppress suppressing the hindrances. And when you do that, you're also suppressing the ability for mind to gain insight and wisdom and clarity on how to deal with that hindrance. Right. So when we do twim jhanas, what we're doing really is starting with the premise, starting with the understanding that the attention will move however it will move. But because there is an open mind, because there's an open awareness, you're able to detect, okay, now the attention is no longer on its object, and now you use the 6R process to recognize that and return it back by dealing with the hindrance in the way of recognizing that there is a craving or recognizing there's an aversion. But you go beyond just noting or recognizing that there is a hindrance, there is an aversion or craving. You go a step further by understanding of letting go of that attention to it and relaxing the formations related to that craving or to that aversion and then bringing up the joy and then returning back to your object. Every time you do this, you are experiencing right effort, which means you are activating or cultivating the Eightfold Path. So the Twim Jhana is all about actually all of the integrated processes of the different parts of the Eightfold Path are happening every time you use the 6R process. Mm -hmm. Now when we talk about Twim, what is Twim? It's, it's Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. So tranquility here is referred to that tranquil awareness. The mind is not super focused, it's just aware. It's tranquil and it's equanimous in the sense that when a hindrance arises, if you're doing twim correctly, you don't get bothered by that hindrance. You see that hindrance as a teacher and you understand that it is shedding light on some kind of an attachment or an aversion. And so you're tranquil about it. You don't get agitated by it and try to fight it or suppress it or do something else with it. You acknowledge it and you let it go. The wisdom, wisdom component of that, there are, there are different levels of wisdom, let's say, in the sense that you are observing how craving is arising. If there is something being taken personal in the way of that hindrance, you're actually observing now there is craving arising. Now the mind is taking this personal. And so from there, there is an insight into that. Now the deeper aspect of that wisdom is that the twim jhanas lead you to cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And because you have continually trained your mind through this process of observing mind's attention, using the six R's to let go and uh, actually uh, destroy that craving in that moment by using the six R's. By continually doing so through the process of the jhanas, when you come out of cessation, perception, feeling, and consciousness, then you have that deep wisdom that is the Dhamma. Then the mind, because of that training, becomes so sharp that it's able to see the links of dependent origination. And that is the experience of wisdom. That is the wisdom into the nature of reality into the nature of the building blocks of perception and how the world is created through that perception. Hmm. So tranquil, to revisit that, tranquil is basically a mind that is open, collected, equanimous, and not super concentrated. Wisdom is the wisdom of understanding how mind's attention moves and then understanding how craving arises and on a deeper level understanding how dependent origination works how this whole process works. The insight that is there is the insight into understanding that there is a craving present and dealing with it. And so the insight that arises also happens whenever you get into deeper levels of cessation throughout the process of jhana. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And you know, one way that's helped me to understand it is that in this other type of jhana, you're often trying to construct an experience, you're saying, I want only the good and I don't want any of the hindrances and I'm going to mm. focus on that good feeling until it really expands and I'm just joy. Yeah. Whereas in the twim jhanas, you're really relaxing the hindrances and the mind focuses on its own. So that only the wholesome is left. It's like you're, you're trimming off the branches or you're yeah. however, whatever analogy you want to use. Right. And my understanding is this is coming directly from the suttas, right? Because there's also this historical aspect where the Vasudhi Magga is talking about this second time of, type of 
uh, jhana, and that led to a lot of confusion. So maybe you could give a little background on what was actually being taught. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Well, I, I just want to say when it comes to the traditional understanding of jhana, that is to say outside of the scope of the suttas, and what has been taught in the different traditions out of the Vasudhi Maga and so on, has always been about two things. Getting a mind to a super collected state, and then after you have that kind of a mind, directing it towards Vipassana practice. So the idea is that this Samatha and the Vipassana are divorced. There's not an actual, uh, there's not an actual harmony between the two. And uh, there is a sutta where it talks about how samatha leads to vipassana. So there's four ways to get to the dhamma. But the first three ways have to deal with samatha and vipassana. And that is to say that there might be first a collected mind. But if that mind is collected in the, in the process of the sutta jhanas, in the twim jhanas, then it will lead to vipassana, which is that insight. So... It is fused anyway. It's not saying that there is only samatha. It's saying that that collectedness is also followed by insight. Mm. That tranquility and meditation is also followed by an awareness, an understanding, a wisdom, an insight. Or the other way around is that the vipassana leads to samatha. And so that could just be an understanding that can happen in the process of meditation. And this is where I was talking about the other day, which is, you get an insight, and that insight allows you to go deeper by letting go further. And then the further you let go, the deeper the insight, and so the step-by-step -step process occurs. It's like the insight leads to further letting go, and the letting go leads to further insight. Then there is the third understanding of the fusion of both. And anytime you go into the jhanas, or rather you go into the suttas, and they talk about the jhanas, they talk about and this is very important to understand, is uh, there's two particular suttas. There is Majjhima Nikaya 44, uh, and there is another one called the Kamabhu Sutta. And they're identical when they're talking about cessation. But the last part of that is, the, the question is, how is this process developed to get to cessation? And the answer in both suttas is, in the English, serenity and insight. Or in other words, samatha and vipassana. So in other words, when we're doing the twim jhanas, we are having that samatha. We are having that calm, collected, meditative state. But in that process, because the mind is open, we're also having the natural vipassana, which is to say, you don't have to force yourself to look at it. It will come up when it comes up, and you're naturally seeing how this process works and unfolds. Hmm. And there's also some practice instructions, even though they're very bare bones in the suttas, right, around how to practice with this open awareness. Yes. Uh, when you look at uh, Majjhima Nikaya 111, it guides you through all of the suttas. Uh, but there are also other recommendations where the, the Buddha or the other mo monastics are talking about how there is this samadhi which is natural the samadhi which isn't forced. It's just letting the mind observe what is happening and seeing how mind's attention moves. So that's really what we've been talking about all this time. Mm -hmm. And with the, the instructions with regard to the breath is really recognize that you're breathing in and out and tranquilize the bodily formations. There's no point where it says focus on the nostril hairs or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, that's a very good point because that has come out of, let's say, the Visuddhi Maga or other traditions that follow that kind of idea, which is you're, you're super focused just below the nostrils or whatever it might be, and then using that super concentrated state, as I said, then they will go into the practice of Vipassana. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, when they talk about the mindfulness of breathing, we're not controlling the breath. We're not observing anything that is super focused. We're just saying... There is an understanding that the breath is long, or there is an understanding that the breath is short, and you're tranquilizing, meaning you're relaxing. You're using the relaxed step to let go of any identification with that process. And if you get deeper into that sutta of the Anapanasati, it also talks about how the four foundations of mindfulness are also developed through that process of being mindful of this process. 
So in other words, even though you are mindful of the breathing process, you're not taking the breath as your object. You're just having an open awareness to see how mind's attention is moving through the body or to the feeling or to the mind or so on. And it takes it even a step further and says how through this process, the seven enlightenment factors are cultivated because it begins with mindfulness and dependent on mindfulness, you have then the discrimination of states or the discernment of states, which is Dhamma Vichaya. From there, there is energy or effort, the right kind of effort. From there, there is a joy that arises, that is the pitti. From there, there is tranquility. From that tranquility, there is collectedness. And from that equi uh, uh, collectedness, there is equanimity. Mm -hmm. That's why when we look at the fourth jhana, it says, because we're going through that process of the enlightenment factors in the first, second, third, and, jhana, uh, and fourth jhana, but by the time you get to the fourth jhana, it says there is a mindfulness born of equanimity. The reason being is at that point, the mind has reached that level of the enlightenment factor of equanimity. And the next step of mindfulness has been conditioned by that equanimity that has been conditioned by the prior enlightenment factors. So it is this sort of cyclical step as well, or cyclical process. And and so with the mindfulness of breathing, it's not about concentrating. It's not about focusing on the breath. It's not about focusing on the nostril. It's about looking and observing how mind's attention is moving. You could do that with any other object in meditation. You could do that with, of course, loving kindness, or you could do it with the Asuba practices, or you can do it with seeing the charnel ground practices, or you could do it with uh, watching or doing walking meditation as well. In walking meditation, you might just be observing the loving kindness, but you're still observing how mind's attention is moving. And the reason you're doing that is one, it's sharpening the mindfulness, and two, in that process, you're recognizing if craving is present or not.